Welcome to Literary Dialogues with Nina Serrano, bringing you wonderful poets and writers, but today, a news reporter for television, Yoli Aceves. She is a veteran news reporter for television. You've probably seen her many times, but now you'll hear her story. We're so glad you're here. Thank you. Um, it's a pleasure and an honor to be here. Thank you. So Yoli, how did you get started as a news photographer? It was, it was totally unexpected. I have to tell you that much because it started uh, back when I was at a CCSF. And um, at the time I did a lot more radio production, if anything else, um, it was more radio production. And this was in the eighties. So music videos were the thing. Right. And I really thought that's where, where I wanted my career to go was like to try pr producing music uh, videos and that stuff. And MTV was just breaking out at the time. But um, a teacher of mine who uh, I was taking her copyright slash news writing uh, class. Um, and I had also had her for another production class she told me to go apply at a position over at Channel 14. She was dating a reporter at the time there, and he was just talking about how a position came up, and she told me to go apply. And I thought, you know, you're insane. I, I have no experience. Uh, how am I going to get this job? And she told me, don't worry. They don't, they're not union. In fact, the reporter was telling me how terrible the, the photographers are. So you have a good chance of getting in, right? Because the standards were so uh, low. So I was like, gee, thanks. Okay. You know, so uh, through her encouragement, she, uh, you know, I, I had enough nerve to go apply for the job. I, I didn't get the job. Uh, in fact, the guy who got the job just basically bs his way better than me because uh, he got the job i got the internship and through my three months internship uh i proved that i learned their how to edit their on their equipment uh whenever a photographer didn't want to do overtime i would go out and shoot for them and and get video for them and uh, apparently i was being more uh, efficient and delivering better quality work than the guy they hired and in fact, they were having a lot of problems with the guy they hired. So at the end of three months, they fired him and hired me, right? What was the situation for women in the media at that time? Definitely the kind of position I had, it was near to none. There was a certain sense of women who had to behave like a man in order to be accepted uh, uh, or be credible. At least that was my impression. Uh, when I met other women in the fields, because there wasn't a whole lot of women uh, working the camera out on the field when it came to, to all the news stations. You had Channel 2, Channel 5, Channel 4, Channel 7, and then, of course, you had Channel 14. And every station had only one ENG woman working at the time. ENG you know? means engineer? Which is like electronic news gathering. That oh. stands for electronic news gathering. So you know, uh, and the rest were, were men. The rest were men. Ignorance is bliss because I wasn't really that aware of it. I was only barely 21 and felt pretty invi invincible. <laughs> you know, I had always been somewhat of a tomboy. So I was always surrounded with a lot of boys or males around me and, and, and felt no, you know, kind of barrier for myself at all. Um, so I pretty much ignored a lot of things. It, it really didn't hit me until I met this other woman from Channel 7 who did not like me. You know, in fact, I got a lot of the pushback from from her than than I did from the men uh, that I met out on the field. And I think it's because of that fact that a lot of uh, so, some of the other women that were there, they they their appearance was uh, very non-feminine, you know, where here I am being brown and loud and Latina, and I had my red lipstick on, I had my hoop earrings on, I had, you know, I had, you know, my, my, my youthful uniform on of like what I was there. It caused guys' heads to turn and they were very helpful with me. And where I think these other women 
had a really had a really strong struggle. Not to say I didn't have my struggles, but I, I definitely was. I don't know. I guess I, I, I was lucky at the time that I came in, you know, to some extent. Like I said, I did I did have my struggles, but I, I didn't realize at the time how uh, the pressure for women, you know, that you, there's only space for one of us here. There's not a whole lot of spaces and it was kind of cutthroat like that, as opposed to where I feel there's a lot more uh, sisterhood out there. There's a lot more support out there. And, you know, why do we have to stop at one position? You know, there should be multiple positions for women to be in the, in, the, in any fields. Right. So, but back then it was, it was pretty stiff competition. So uh, there was somewhat of uh, a little bit of hostility that I encountered from other women, which really, surprised and shocked me because I've always, always been down for the sisterhood. And that, and that, that did kind of shock me a little bit. Time. So was it difficult to carry the video equipment? Yes, it was because it was much heavier. We had three quarter inch. So you had like almost the size of a, like a, a typewriter case, you know, like three quarter inch deck that was attached to a cable to a huge camera. At the time I used a, an Ikigami which was this tube camera. Now we have like, you know, little small discs that, that work, but it was a tube camera. And um, so all together with that and the, and the three quarter inch, and then I had the battery bill for my portable light. I, I had easily another extra 55 pounds on me very easily. So, but you know, I have broad shoulders to carry the, all that equipment. So, <laughs> Um, so, and so I was lucky as I aged, the equipment got smaller and lighter. So <laughs> I lucked out. <laughs> I remember you're saying that you had to climb up on top of vans sometimes to get a good shot. Was that with yes. the 55 pounds on your shoulder? Yeah, at one time, yes. Uh, and then definitely as time went by, it went from 55 pounds to about 25 pounds and still lugging 25 pounds up to the top of a van and trying to get the shot. That was, that's pretty, that's pretty commonplace. Although now a lot of safety regulations, they, they don't allow us to get up on the van anymore. That it's too much of a, of a risk. So <laughs> I was like, okay, that's fine. I'll, I'll abide by that. <laughs> but it, I, I did have a pretty adventurous time. In fact, one of my first time, and this was when I was working at channel 14, which really turned me on to news when I, when I finally got hired with them, one of, uh, one of the first most exciting uh, assignments that I got, it was pretty simple, but it was to get on a, in a helicopter and, and to get videotape of all of the Bay Area, like they were circling the whole, you know, Embarcadero area. And it was one of those things where they attached a whole harness to me and all of a sudden the door just slide open and it was just open door and me hanging out with the camera getting video of that. and. I just got so like turned on by this lifestyle of news that every day was going to be different. Every day was going to be something unknown, you know, and, and exciting and adventurous. But that was also me being very naive <laughs> because, you know, there are those moments, there are really wonderful times where I've been so privileged to have a really exciting experience, but there's also a lot of tragedy in news that, that, that I, had to bear witness to and that that can wear on people you know that can wear on, it, it certainly is uh things that i will never forget some of people's other worst days of their lives that i i kind of carry it with them so it also sounds terrifying yeah being in it, front of an open door in a helicopter with all this weight on you and it oh. was probably your first time in a helicopter it was. It was my first time, but I don't know. I'm a bit of a thrill seeker, so I was. I know I. I wasn't afraid. It, it was. It was exciting. It was really, actually, quite exciting for me. <laughs> I really, really did enjoy it. How do you deal when you with the tragedy that you mentioned, that you have to bear witness to people's tragedies? Well, um, I'm happy to say that I have always been sympathetic to people's tragedies. So I feel like I've always been someone who's been very sensitive to what this person is going through, you know, at that time. And through my own growth, personal growth, own personal tragedies, um, 
my approach has always been, has only gotten, I think, more sensitive. And, and, and at some point having to tell producers that, no, you're not going to get that. Let them have their time. No, I'm not going to run after this person. You know, we had enough, you know? So uh, when I'm out there, you know, I remember that we're, we're people first before anything else. And then, and then I try to get the story, you know, and just because I would want that same courtesy. When you talk about getting the story, does that mean that you have the control of the story, that you edit the story, or that you slant the story? I don't have control of the assignment. Whatever they give me is what they give me. And, I, and there's been times where I push for something, but they're like, okay, thanks for that, but we want you on this. So I don't have control of the assignment, um, but once I'm on the assignment, uh, I may be asked to like, well, you got to get this person or you got to get, you know, whatever it is, the, a certain element or, 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 you know, set up. And I try, I try to provide that, you know, and, and get that for the, for the station and for the story. But there is sometimes executive, executive uh, um, decisions you have to make on, out on the field, you know, and that's just the way it is. And that's where, you know, your, your news director or your executive producer has to trust you, has to trust you out on the field. And I've had battles with, you know, some of the uh, executive producers of like, no, sorry, you're going to just have to trust me on this, or you have to, or I did the right call and they might've not liked what I did, you know, but I know I did the right call. You know, I, I can remember uh, this one occasion it was three, it was two reporters and me as a photographer. One was, there was a protest that was happening at BART in San Francisco, downstairs. And then upstairs, uh, there was the whole police line upstairs and up on the, on the street level. And um, basically the reporter that I was working with, the reason why I was working with him was because he had a hurt back and he couldn't do camera for himself. He was ordinarily what they call a VJ, a video video journalist where he shoots and edits and reports all by himself. Right. But he heard his back. So they had me with him. Um, the reporter downstairs was saying, I need you only down here. It's getting really, really, you know, crazy down here. People are really starting to stop the trains and, and it looks like the tactical team is going to be coming in here soon. And, uh, not the assignment desk or the producer were, was listening to him. And, and we had to keep fighting and fighting. He and I both kept saying, I kept saying like, let me just go down there. If nothing happens, I'll come back up and deal with the other guy. I'll put the camera on the tripod. He won't have to touch it. He won't hurt his back. Let me run down there. And finally they said, yes, go down there, Yoli. And they wanted a live shot. And at the and and they told me at such the last minute to go down there, down down below to the BART station, that uh, there was a crucial time where we had to make a decision: do I go and make the live shot, or do I get this guy who is basically getting hogtied by the police and carried up the stairs? And I decide to go get the video of the guy getting tied up, right? And I miss my live shot. And they were upset that I missed my live shot. And I said, no, I did the right call because you needed that video. You're going to see that video everywhere else. If I would have went and did my live shot, you wouldn't have gotten that video. That video was more important than my live shot. No one's going to remember my live shot. Everyone's going to remember that video. They, they still thought that I did the wrong call and I still think I did the right call. <laughs> You know? And I'll tell you one other thing, all the other producers for the late, on the later shows thought I did the right call too, because they got to use that video. They, you know, they weren't going to use my live shot. So there's, there's, you know, those are those little executive calls you have to make out on the field to get the, I think that was the more important story. What was it like to transition from Spanish language TV to English language TV? I started at Channel 14 in 1986. Uh, a year later, Telemundo started 
out here in the West Coast. And I applied for that job right away, worked with them from uh, 1987 to basically 1990. And then from there, I transitioned over to Cron 4. And, I, and at that, I was just starting to be a, uh, I started off as a freelancer for Channel 4. Um, so the transition from Spanish to English, it was really hard because I, I really did like working in Spanish television. It would, I felt like I was serving the community so much more, that it was so much more vital and important to serve for the community. Unfortunately, the conditions that I was working under at Channel, 4, uh, Channel 48 were not good. And it was being it was being overworked and underpaid. And there was and in fact, I'm, I'm happy and proud to say that me, along with uh, my husband at the time, who wasn't my husband and some other friends, we we actually uh, were able to be, uh, make Channel 48 a union place because so many people were not getting paid correctly, were over were being overworked. And so we really kind of helped usher a union in there before I left. And so that's, I feel good about that. Uh, but that was one of the main things that, that kind of catapulted that whole movement was me quitting there and then moving over to uh, Channel 4 as, as a freelancer. And I, and I guess the hardest, the hardest part about it was that, you know, here I was doing immigration stories and really stories that were really important to all of a sudden to a story where like it was, uh, you know, these poor kids that have to live on Angel Island and get transported to school by a boat. And I was like, I don't know, they don't seem like they're suffering. <laughs> so just a whole different perspective, just a whole different types of stories, more like I got to work on a lot of fluff stories, you know, at the time. Um, and now, now that I do so many horrible stories, I welcome to doing something more positive and, 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 you know, that, I mean, I, I want to do important stories too, but um, sometimes it's, it's, it's just so doom and gloom that you need to alleviate and find beauty and, and good and good people and good things that are happening to people too. And, and celebrate those stories as well. So I start, you start to realize how, why diversity is so important in any, in any uh, business, because, um, your perspective comes in there. And, and there was plenty of, of uh, stories that where I think about, like, if I wasn't there, how would that story have come out? And there was one story that really stood out the most to me. And it was actually on, on one of my first years there or second year or something. No, it was about the first year that I was there. And I'm a freelancer at the time. And, and when you're a freelancer, it's kind of important to, to make a good impression because uh, if they like you, they call you back, you know, and, and if they keep calling you back, then when a position opens, then it's more likely they'll hire you over someone else that they've never seen before. So there was a new story where this um, reporter and I, and uh, he was, you know, white reporter who was doing a, a story on this woman who basically got, um, divorce papers in the mail and she said i never been married she goes i don't know why i'm getting divorce papers in the, in the mail and it turned out um that uh this this man basically thought he married this particular woman but it was he was marrying uh, how do i put it so the person that he married to get his immigration papers uh was an imposter she, she stole the identity of this other woman and, you know, posed that it's like, you know, they pose that, so, for example, like you as uh, Nina Serrano, but was not Nina Serrano. And the guy who married her really thought he was marrying Nina Serrano, right? So, um, you know, when, so we get the point of view of the woman who got these divorce papers, right? And then we went and tracked down the guy who sent her the divorce papers. And I remember the, the reporter saying like, okay, you're gonna stand over here on the corner, just zoom in and I'm gonna wear a wireless mic and I'm gonna go knock on the door. And it was this whole feeling like, oh, secret investigation. And I started really feeling horrible about it. 
And, um, and then when he, when he knocked on the door, but I'm, you know, I'm videotaping and he, when he knocked on the door and the, and the person answered the door, I could see that it was a woman who spoke only Spanish and I could hear kids because, you know, he, he has a wireless mic and he asked for the guy and, um, and the guy came and then, you know, they were acting very nervous and here I am feeling horrible for these people because, you know, this is the community I used to serve at channel 48, you know, in Spanish television. And it, and it was, it almost felt like, aha, we gotcha. And, you know, I, I picked up the camera and went over there. I was no longer going to be in hiding. And I went over there and I immediately started talking to them in Spanish, you know, and the reporter was really surprised because he didn't know I spoke Spanish. And the first thing I wanted to tell him was relax. We're not immigration. You know, we're from a news team and, you know, we just want to talk to you about a story. So I, you know, I kind of stopped the whole charade of like, we got to investigative, you know, story and, and, and try to be very upfront with these people. And, you know, what came across is that I told, you know, the reporter is like, you know, I know that maybe it's not uh, technically that legal with what this guy was doing, but he wasn't. He really thought he was marrying this person. You know, he really thought he had somebody's consent to get married and, and do this, you know, pretend we're married for about a year so that he could get his paper. He's not stealing this woman's identity. He's not, he's a victim as much as she's a victim. You know, he gave money to somebody to get his papers and, and, and the reporter had never seen it in that light, you know? And I just think about like, if, if I wasn't there with my perspective, how would have this whole story unfolded? And, and he was able to incorporate that in the story as well. And of course, once I got back to the station, then I called up, uh, La Raza, uh, what is it? Um, what is it? Uh, La Raza Legal, Legal Legal, or uh, I forget the name of the, the office now. But, you know, I called the family back up I gave him information to a, a law office. I told, you know, the woman was crying and I felt bad and I apologized to them. And, and I tried to get them legal help to help in their situation, in their situation. So, I mean, that's why I, I just feel like it, it is really, really important for us to have diversity because it's like, you know, I don't think that part of the story would have came out that way if I wasn't there you know, with my perspective and, and from my community, you know? Yes. And with your empathy. Yes. Yeah. So your jobs with the technology changing must have also changed because haven't you also become the reporter as well as the photographer? Yes, I have. Like uh, up until 2005, I was, you know, back then, um, they were separate positions and I, I was able to do quite a different jobs, but I would go, I would go in, if I was going in it as, as an editor, that's all I did was edit that whole day. Or if I went in as a photographer, I would go out with the reporter and I was a photographer for that day. Or if I was a van operator, I would meet up with the reporter and photographer, uh, to do live shots for our shows. Like we had a five, four o'clock show, a five o'clock, a six o'clock and 11 o'clock. And so I would just, and that's all I would concentrate on is doing a live shot, you know, and that's it. And, or just concentrate on doing the camera work or just concentrate on editing. And so now that has all come into one position. And when did and, that and then start? Two, well, they started like, uh, as, as, Van operators, we started editing out, out in the van. So we are now in charge of editing the story and then doing, uh, um, what's it called? And then doing, and doing the live shot. And that kind of started, I would, I would have to say in the middle of the mid, uh, about 90, 93, 94, somewhere around there. And then all of a sudden now as a live, uh, van operators sometimes I would go out with the reporter all day long and we would shoot and then I would edit and then I would do their live shot 
And I was still fine, okay, with that because it was all in the realm of being on the technical side and behind the camera, which is where I feel most comfortable. And, um, but then in 2005, um, Ron Four had this idea and we, and we had just gotten sold to Star Media and they wanted to make us all one man bands. And, and they tried to couch find a one man band. One man band. So you're going to shoot, edit, and report everything on your own. And um, it, to me, it's, it's been a disaster since. It really has been because there's a time constraint that's attached to that, you know? And it's a lot of pressure for some, for one person to deal with on a daily basis because you have only so much time to do something. When you're broken up in teams, like, you know, when you have a, when you have a reporter and a photographer, as a photographer, you could really just kind of concentrate on the, on the shooting part of it and, and all that. But as a reporter, you have to pay attention to the information and be able to, you know, repeat that information and give it accurately and trying to do both. It's, it's very hard. It's, it's actually quite, you know, demanding to try to do that. And, um, something suffers, you know, from that, either the shooting's going to suffer or, you know, the information's going to suffer. And most of the time it's going to be the shooting because you don't want to give out inaccurate information. It's also been a, a, a liability as far as being out there on your own, uh, physically, you know, safety wise, you know, we've had, it's gotten a lot more hostile out there, out on the streets. And at least when you're with another, like, you know, if it's a reporter photographer, as you're doing your live shot, you know, at least the photographer can be watching your back and looking out for you. Right. Where when you're out there by yourself, you know, there's just, in fact, just uh, oh, this past weekend, uh, we had this one reporter doing her live shot by herself in front of 850 Bryant. And during the middle of her live shot, you see uh, this man, clearly someone who's houseless and also has some you know, long-term mental uh, illness and, and, and mental health issues. And you know, he came up behind her and she's reporting She's a new and younger reporter and he came up behind her and he punched her in the back in the middle of her, her live shot. You know, now if I was there, I could see him coming. I could intercept him. I could direct him off to a little off to the side while she continues doing her, her live shot. Most times out of always, whenever I am with a reporter and those kind of things happen, I'm always able to divert the person and it not end up in any kind of violence. Whereas this person was by herself and he just came up right behind her. He's shouting. She's trying to ignore him while going on with her, her live shot. And he then punched her in her back and then walked off. And she just went like this right into the camera. And you could see like she's almost ready to break down, but she's trying to finish her report. You know, and it's it's just so uncalled for. I mean, it's like, I don't know. I, I, I'm not very happy with us going into being a one man band and social media is a whole other other beast that has been added to us that that you know they want you to tw tw uh, put things on twitter put things on facebook put things on instagram if you have snapchat and you know you're trying to post on all these uh social platforms it's like do you have even time to get the story <laughs> you know <laughs> it's it's you know, it might be easier for younger people who have or who who somehow just, you know, know how to gravitate to these social, you know, uh, platforms. But someone who came from no social platform and, and, and kind of growing with it, I still find it challenging to constantly, you know, be updating these these all these platforms at one time, you know, and, and it's like, you know, you still got to try to get the information to me that's the most important it's better to put out accurate information 30 minutes from now than trying to put out something immediately as you get there and and not really know what it is and, and a lot of times there is that pressure that demand like you send me a photo for our web can you send me this for for the web you know and it's like i will i will i'll, I'll get it to you don't worry you'll have it you know so on the daily it's just a lot of demand 
Um, so, and, and, and this has really, really has transpired since 2005. And all this while you were raising three children. <laughs> yes, I didn't do it alone. You know, my husband and I, we were able to work it out where I did the morning show and he worked in the afternoon from home. So uh, there was someone with the children all the time, you know, um, whether it was dropping them off, he would drop them off at school and I would pick them up and take them to all their after school uh, activities because I start, I, I start work at 3 a.m. and it ends at 11 a.m. So they gave me time to come home eat, take a nap and be ready for them when they got out of school. So, and then we were also fortunate to have like my mother around to kind of have those occasional date nights, you know, going out. But for the most part, we, we just always had our kids with us and really, really enjoyed always having them around us. So I didn't find it too hard. <laughs> well, it seems like nothing for you is too hard. Oh, no, there is. <laughs> no, really, you know, I, I, I say I'm very comfortable behind the scenes because to me, um, I, I, I'm a journalist because that's what I do. But when I, I've, I've been able to work with real journal, journalists. And what I mean by real journalists, these are people who, you know, so, uh, they, they wanted to be a journalist since they were like in middle school or since high school. And they went to journalism school and they and they and they write beautifully and and could really tell a story beautifully where, um, you know, I majored in broadcasting and more of it was more in production. And and even though I could tell a story, I like I really like it in the form of having people tell the story, not me telling the story. I like to hear from them and weave it together with picture and sound. And, and when you talk about daily news, that's not really how daily news is presented. You know, there's no time to be able to sit back and listen to what the person said and put it together. You have to make quick decisions right away and see what what's the important soundbite and what are we going to put out there? And um, it, it's, it doesn't um, leave a whole lot of time to try to do it the way you want to do it. In fact, I had this uh, really not a wonderful supervisor who has retired since, but when I was editing for daily news, he used to tell me, Yoli, I need that video. I need it. And I'm like, okay, it's, a, it's coming. It's coming. It's coming. And he would just tell me, look, if you want art, go to the museum. <laughs> I need the video. <laughs> and so sometimes it would just be like, okay, here it is. So how do you feel about art? The art of video. The art of, oh, I love it. I, I, I love it. I, I mean, I've had experience of being able to produce some really wonderful stuff, but every time when you do produce something like that, it does take time. It takes time for you to do that. You know, it takes, uh, you know, you gotta really think about, I, it, it just takes time. It's bottom line, it takes time. And I, and I love storytelling in that, in that form. I think it's a wonderful way to tell stories. I love radio. Uh, and how to tell stories on radio. I think, like, that's why I said, even, even in school, most of my uh, production background was in radio production. Uh, again, I just think radio is a wonderful medium of how to tell a story and as a viewer, how to get sucked in and how to use your imagination and actual words from people and, and blend that together. And I really love that about radio. And, and video is just another way of also telling a story, which I also love. Well, you've Very been a magnificent, magnificent storyteller telling your story. Oh, thank you. Which we really appreciate. Do you thank have any you. thoughts for the future? I hope that uh, possibly I'll be able to do more storytelling in a more relaxed fashion with maybe hopefully finding people like to work with and, and, and try to be their photographer and the editor. I hope to do that when I can retire, <laughs> get away from daily news, get away from the daily grind and be able to just take the moment to tell a story uh, beautifully or give it justice. Uh, like it, it needs to be told that would, that would be nice to be working on something like that. Well, thank you. Are there any last thoughts? 
things I didn't ask about that you'd like to mention? Um, to some extent, I am burnt out on, on uh, daily news, but I do know that, you know, anybody who wants to go into it, I suggest they do. Just bring your humanity with you. Don't let the business drive that out of you because I, I've seen it happen to some people where they're just, uh, they're just cruel. They're just cruel to their, to their coworkers or, or, you know, insensitive to the people who, who are telling you the story. And, um, and we need a lot more sensitive people in the news industry who's going to be a lot more humane in there. So, um, if you do, if you are planning on doing it, just keep your humanity with you and because we need it. We need that in news. A lot, a lot has changed. And, and in fact, you, we were just uh, recently just, you know, me and another reporter were writing up, a, what's it called, HR about someone's behavior of being just hostile and just, you know, degrading people around them you know and they think they can do that just because they're an anchor and it's like no you can't you can't do that you know it's not right enough is enough so you know and 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 even the my executive producer right now he's just someone who's like you know uh just just barely a year ago right before the pandemic is still using language like um uh illegal aliens you know and we got into a whole like discussion about it like yeah um when when the rep this other reporter had this immigration story and and he told the ep that he goes no um you know the term is undocumented immigrant right and the ep took it as like wow if i thought you were going to have a problem with the story i would have assigned someone else and, and the reporter was like, I don't have a problem with the story. I have a problem with your term. You know, that that's not the term we use. Well, INS, I mean, ICE uses it and he goes, and they can use it. But as reporters, we don't use this. We don't use that term, you know, anymore. And it's in the uh, uh, AP Bible, you know, a, a reporter Bible that, that, you know, this is the term we use. And he uh, got us all into the thread to try to address this executive producer about it. And I remember chiming in and saying, um, as a person of Latino descent, I go, I'm Mexican American and being from the Latino community, uh, what is your problem with using undocumented immigrant? Uh, that is the appropriate term. It wins favors to the community and uh, you're doing, you know, it's a win-win situation. Why are you stuck on Ill illegal alien? And he'd had no response to me. And uh, the only, uh, and then uh, the news director chimed in and at first said, you know, I don't care what you guys use. And then I said, okay, well now I'm officially offended. <laughs> <laughs> because me and the other Latino in the room are telling you guys, this is an offensive term to use illegal aliens. I am officially offended that you are disregarding our voice. And then there was radio silent, but then there was a mass email sent out to the whole newsroom. We will not use the term illegal aliens we will use the term undocumented immigrant. What a great story. You know, and it's like, again, this is why it's important for us to be presented in every field, in every field, you know, because we're defending constantly. That was a battle that I thought was won back in the 90s. And here we are, you know, and that happened in 2000, you know, 20. It's like, why are we repeating this? Why are we even talking about this? You know? So it's, it's always a constant battle. It's a constant battle on every front. Freedom is a constant struggle. Yes, it is. Yoli, okay. how did the pandemic impact your work? Oh, greatly, greatly. In fact, for a whole year, almost every single day was all about the pandemic in every way. 
how many people were getting sick, how overworked some of the hospitals were, how things were shutting down, uh, you know, how many people are getting sick. Sometimes when I did work with a reporter, he, you know, we used to be in the same car, but because of the pand pandemic, we started being separate cars and we would only come out to do the, the um, you know, do the live shot and have our mask on. But it was also a weight on our minds constantly of like, are, am I going to get sick? Because, you know, here we are going to, you know, where, when they when they were doing testing, when they were opening up like some of the COVID test centers, you know, people who were in line, those are people who are most likely going to be ill. And so now, you know, and they wanted us to get interviews with people who are waiting in line. And at some point we were like, we're not getting interviews with people in line. We're not going to get sick, you know, <laughs> because there might be a chance that person is ill. And especially during the whole time that, that uh, we didn't know how transmittable it was. It was still all very new. You know, there was a short time we weren't interviewing anyone unless it was over Zoom, you know? And then, uh, and then after that, we got like long poles and added and attached a mic to it once we knew we had to be like six feet away. And so, you know, now, now I'm you know, interviewing someone and then I'm, I'm just sticking out the pole with the mic at the end and having them talk to it. Or I would tape it to a light stand and I would go up to the light stand and with the mic attached to it and ask the question, step back, and then the person would come forward and then talk to me and I would, you know, get them that way, get their interview that way. And whenever there was any kind of, especially during fire season, fire season was really, really difficult of trying to be mindful of being apart from people, but also getting the video or getting, you know, uh, the CDC when they're going to talk to us. In fact, when they would come up, they would be at a podium and we were all like six feet apart, separated and out on the field, you know, trying to get the interview from the CDC. So it's all logistically always having that, how are we gonna set it up? And it wasn't until like, when I got my vaccination, did, you re did I realize how much it weighed on me, possibly getting my mother ill or getting my, my husband ill who has heart issues and, you know, my mother who, you know, was close to 90 years old and who I would go and I would get tested. And if my you know, test came out negative, then I would spend the next two days trying to make sure she had groceries or help her out or visit with her or, or spend some time still with the mask on, you know, so it, you know, we were, we were one of those essential workers who didn't get a va vaccinated until way, way later in the game. So it, it, it's, it's been challenging, but the most challenging of all being out on the field was trying to find a bathroom because everything was closed. <laughs> everything was closed down. So trying to find a bathroom out on the field was very challenging. Well, thank you. You have met all the challenges so far. <laughs> yes. And so well. Thank you so much for this interview. We really right. appreciate it. And All look right, forward thanks. to seeing you on TV. Okay, thank you, Nina. <laughs>